You can see very few people. This is the end of the route. Very few people were there. But you, you can see Mary Mormon. They can see him right there. Jean Hill, Mary Mormon. She's got her camera up to her eye. Can you see that? You can see Clint Hill's about to fall off the back of that thing. This version tracks the limousine and maintains President Kennedy and Governor Connolly at center frame. This version is only in slow motion. Okay, you can see the President easily here. You can see him waving, see the picture of him waving here. Everything's fine to this point. He's still waving. He comes out from behind the sign and right away trouble. You can see his hands going up to his neck. Again, I'm looking at this wondering. Here's Connolly. Here's his hand. You can see it pretty clear. And here's his hat. Okay. You can see Roy Kellerman making, kind of making a turn here. And Mrs. Kennedy with that look on her face of, gee, I wonder what's happening here. Now you can see his hands even clearer. Hand still has the Stetson. Is it his left hand that the bullet goes into? Right. Right hand? Right wrist, yeah. Now I wonder what's happened here because he's making a turn. And he's looking back at the president. Now if I go back just a hair here, you see kind of a gasp in his mouth. See if I can find that. And you can see that Conley, I think this is to me, maybe when he's hit, is there. See his mouth open? It looks like his wrist is still limply hanging on to his hat. Hard to tell. Mrs. Connolly going, what's going on? Mrs. Kennedy, what's going on? Now you see Connolly falling back into his wife's arms. Mrs. Kennedy's head four to six inches from the president's. Here's Gene Hill. Here's Mary Mormon. There's the impact. Now, not being gross, but I want to make a point here. Look how close Jackie's face is to his head. Look how close it is now. Keep, a, keep an eye on this ear right here. This piece right here, not being gross, is the whole side of his head. It was just a brutal, brutal assassination. And there's Clint Hill trying to get her back into the vehicle. This version zooms in on the image as much as possible without causing deterioration. President Kennedy is kept at center frame. This is only in slow motion. Again, he's brushed his hair. He's waving. He goes behind. He comes out. He's obviously hit. Connolly looks like he's hit there. Mrs. Kennedy's got a hold of his left arm. Figuring out what's going on, she leans in incredibly close, and there you go. Roses flying everywhere. Mrs. Kennedy heading back for the back of the limousine, trying to retrieve a piece of the octopal bone of the president's head. Wasn't it often said that she was trying to help the Secret Service agent on the call? Help the Secret Service what? Get, get, get him onto the car. Oh, well, I, that that's might have been said, but it wasn't what she was doing, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Certainly wasn't what it's she was doing. reported that way. Yeah. So now we'll talk a little bit about, here's this poor Abraham Zapruder, and look what he's just taken a picture of. And he's as shocked as anyone, and it turns out he's going to be the only guy that has any film of this whole thing. Well, after Zapruder captured this horrific assassination on film, he was very shaken. He walked back to his office, and on his way back to the office, he ran into Harry McCormick, who was a reporter for the Dallas Morning News. And Zapruder told McCormick about what he had just 
film and arranged to meet with the reporter back in his office at the Dallas <coughs> building. Now, before meeting Zapruder, McCormick informed Forrest Sorrells, who was the head of the Dallas branch of the Secret Service of the film. So this is taking place during the time they're going to the hospital, and so we're going to be kind of going back and forth, but I wanted to keep a focus on Zapruder. Well, after Zapruder arrived back to his office, his business partner, Urban Schwartz, called the office to talk about the news of the president's assassination. He had no idea what Zapruder had done. And Schwartz was told by the secretary when he called in that the police were in the office with shotguns looking for that film. And she continued to tell Schwartz that Zapruder had ordered her to lock the film in the office safe, which was a smart move. Schwartz then asked the secretary to put him through to Abraham Zapruder's telephone because he wanted to talk to him. And when Schwartz began to speak to his partner Zapruder, Zapruder who was crying, and he stated to Schwartz, quote, Oh, Irwin, it was terrible. I saw his head come off. Well, both Forrest Sorrells and Harry McCormick then came to Zapruder's office and retrieved the film from the safe, and the three men then took the film to a nearby television station to get it developed. Well, at the television station, it was discovered that only a Kodak photo company could develop the film. And so because of this, McCormick used his connections with the media and made arrangements with Kodak to develop the film. Well, once the film was developed and viewed, three copies were made and given to the following. The FBI got a copy, the Secret Service got a copy, and Abraham Zapruder got a copy, and he also kept Zapruder, the original film, as well. Well, after the film was developed, Richard Stoley, who was a representative from Life magazine, viewed the film. And he asked Zapruder about the possibility of purchasing the film. And since Stoley was the first person from the media to ask about the purchase, Life was given the first opportunity by Zapruder to purchase it. Well, Staley's first offer was a sum of 5000 for the film. And Zapruder knew it was worth a lot more than that. And when negotiations reached the $50,000 figure, Stoley had to call his superiors in New York to negotiate any further. Well, by, on, by noon on Saturday, November 23rd, Life magazine bought the print rights only, not the video rights, but the print rights only for two payments of $25,000 apiece. And as a result, Stoley received the camera original and another copy of the film for that $50,000. Well, the original film was taken back to Chicago, where Life magazine published at the time. The copy was sent to New York, which was the business headquarters of Life magazine. And on Sunday, November 24th, the publisher of Life magazine, C.D. Jackson, watched the 26-second film. And after viewing the horrific film, he decided the American public was not ready to see such a sight of the president's death. And so he instructed Stoley to go purchase the motion picture rights to the film so he would be the only one that could show that to the public. And that actually was not shown on television until 1975. No one saw it until then uh, as far as the public audience. Well, Stoley called Zapruder and asked, hey, we want to purchase the motion picture rights to the film as well. The two agreed to meet Monday morning, November 25th, to discuss the negotiations, and Life offered Zapruder another $100,000 for all rights to the film, and he agreed to sell. So he made $150,000, which would be $1.2 million in today's currency, if you want to get an idea. So Life magazine owned the film. Okay? Well, we'll get away from that part, and we'll talk about what happened at Parkland Hospital as the motorcade arrives. It reaches Parkland Hospital at 12.36 p.m. Didn't take them long to get there, six minutes, basically, from the shots. One of the men who witnessed this horrific event was a Texas Ranger by the name of Milton Wright. And he's the guy up here with the cowboy hat on, right up there. Rufus Youngblood's up there, too. You have to take a look at that when we get done. And Wright was a Texas Ranger, and he was riding in the fifth car of the motorcade 
with Dallas Mayor, Mayor Earl Cavill and his wife, which followed the presidential limousine to the hospital. Well, Wright helped lift the wounded Governor Conley out of the limousine's jump seat and onto the gurney that took him into the hospital for emergency care. And Milton White Wright was later quoted as saying, as soon as we got him, meaning Connolly, out, a Secret Service guy ran up in the car and pulled the president over to one side. I could see partially the side of his head was gone. Wright was then asked to help put President Kennedy on a gurney and then stood guard outside the hospital. Would you ever forget that in your lifetime? Well, the president was removed from the limousine after some hard protest from Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, Jackie refused to allow Agent Clint Hill to take her husband into the hospital. And Clay, uh, Agent Clint Hill pleaded with Jackie in the car to let the agents take the president into the hospital. Jackie, we've got to take him in. Mrs. Kennedy, we've got to put him, take him in. Mrs. Kennedy, she would not let him take the president into the hospital. Anybody know why? Know why? Yeah, you can't story. answer this. No? Clint Hill just can't believe it. He's sitting there, Mrs. Kennedy, we've got to take him in. Mrs. Kennedy, she even says, Mr. Hill, you know he's dead. Mr. You know, so why didn't she want him taken in? Clint Hill finally figured it out. And when he figured it out, he took <coughs> off his sport coat. And what did he do with it? Covered, Covered the president's head because she did not want him to be publicly displayed in there, because there was people around. So Clint Hill finally clicked with him, and he took off his sport coat and covered the president's bloody head, and then Jackie allowed Hill to remove the wounded president and take him into Parkman Hospital. Now, a witness to this event was Nurse Phyllis Hall. This is kind of an interesting story. Phyllis Hall was right up there, and she was a witness to this thing I just told you with Clint Hill. Now, Nurse Hall was asked to obtain a gurney and she raced it to the presidential limousine and witnessed the scene as President Kennedy was removed and placed on the gurney. Senator Ralph Yarborough, who was also there, he followed the limousine to Parkland, was later quoted as saying, The minute the car stopped, the Secret Service rushed at Johnson and formed a corridor around him. I heard one of them say, Mr. President, to Johnson, and I knew then that Kennedy was dead. Kennedy was rushed into Trauma 1, which is an emergency room at the hospital at Parkland. The first physician to see the president was Dr. James uh, Carrico. He was a 28-year-old res resident in surgery, and he reported the following after examining the president. He reported one small wound of the anterior neck in the lower one-third. He reported one wound that shredded the brain tissue, which had, which had profuse oozing. He also reported no blood pressure or pulse was present, and he also reported the president's pupils were dilated and fixed. Dr. Don Curtis, and all these guys are on the board there, Dr. Don Curtis, who was assisting Dr. Carrico, unbuttoned President Kennedy's bloody shirt and saw what he thought was a bullet wound in the president's throat. The president was then examined by attending surgeon, 34-year-old Dr. Malcolm Perry. And Dr. Perry, with the help of Dr. Robert McClellan, immediately performed a tracheometry in an attempt to improve the president's breathing. Well, what did they do when they performed the trach? They put the incision for the trach over the bullet wound in Kennedy's throat. They weren't concerned about that at the time, but it obviously ruined the evidence to determine whether it was an entrance wound or an exit wound by those that were conspiracy theorists that shot he, thought he was shot from the front. Well, again, Dr. Perry performed the incision for the trach over the bullet wound in Kennedy's throat as Dr. McClellan held a retractor. Dr. Perry then began CPR on President Kennedy and was able to raise what, he, what was medically reported as, quote, a semblance of a heartbeat. Dr. Ronald Jones had earlier established an intravenous line of President Kennedy's left leg in the event he needed blood and Dr. Jones also inserted a chest tube into the president at the time. Secret Service agent Roy Kellerman then went into trauma one to evaluate the president's condition. Once Kellerman saw the severity of the president's wounds, he hollered out to agents to get a telephone line to the White House immediately. Uh, Clint Hill secured the line and was talking to the White House on the telephone when he was interrupted by the operator. 
and the operator stated to Agent Hill that Attorney General Robert Kennedy was on the phone and wanted to talk to him. Robert Kennedy simply asked Agent Hill, how bad is it? Agent Hill was later quoted as saying, I didn't know what to tell him. I really didn't know what to say. I simply said, it's as bad as it can get. Outside the trauma room, Mrs. Kennedy sat on a wooden chair. A Dallas police sergeant by the name of Robert Bob Duger, who was near the first lady as she sat on that wooden chair outside the trauma room, was later quoted as saying, she asked me if I had a cigarette, and I said, I'm sorry, but I don't smoke. She said, I have some cigarettes in my purse. Will you get them for me? One of the Secret Service guys came over and said, get your hand out of Mrs. Kennedy's bag. But she put him down pretty quick. In other words, she got after him for getting on Sergeant Duger. Well, after Dr. Perry's attempt to revive President Kennedy, it was obvious that the situation was hopeless. Finally, Dr. Kemp Clark who was the chief of neurosurgery, was the person who pronounced Kennedy dead by saying, it's time to stop the resuscitation. This is incompatible with life. Standing next to Dr. Clark and Jackie Kennedy was nurse Phyllis Hall, who turned and said to Mrs. Kennedy, I am so sorry for your loss. That was the lady that went and got the gurney. This is interesting. Nurse Hall later stated that Mrs. Kennedy just stared straight ahead and didn't appear to hear her and Nurse Hall was then asked to help prep Governor Connolly for surgery. Ironically, three weeks earlier, before the Kennedy assassination, Nurse Phyllis Hall assisted in the care of Marina Oswald during the birth of her second child. Mm -hmm. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. I mean, just the history behind that. After Dr. Kemp Clark pronounced the president dead, there was a delay in the notification of death. Why, Fran? As you said it before, the delay in announcing the president's death was to honor Mrs. Kennedy's wish that what? Last a priest be oh, allowed to be given the last rites of the Catholic Church. Dr. Steve Landegren, who's on the board, who was working with the Secret Service agents throughout the entire ordeal, called for a priest to Parkland Hospital. At 12.57 p.m., Father Oscar Huber arrived at Parkland Hospital with his assistant, Father James Thompson. Huber administered the last rites for President Kennedy and was later quoted as saying the following. He was covered with a sheet, which I removed from over his forehead before administering conditionally the last rites of the Catholic Church. Mrs. Kennedy bent over and seemed to kiss the President. During this most trying ordeal, the perfect composure maintained by Mrs. Kennedy was beyond comprehension. I will never forget the blank stare in her eyes and the signs of agony on her face. In a low voice, she thanked me graciously and asked me to pray for the president. Father Thompson, who assisted Father Huber, stated the following after the last rites were administered. This is incredible. I went to the president's wife, took her hand, and the best way I could offered my condolences. Having just left Parkland, suddenly I was aware that my right hand was sticking to the steering wheel. Then I realized that I had the blood of a president on my hand. My God, he said. In other words, he had shake, taken her hand and she had it on her glove. At 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was pronounced dead. After the president's body was placed in a casket, Mrs. Kennedy slipped off her wedding band, and according to Sergeant Duggar, who is now in Trauma 1, Quote, she tried to put it on his ring finger, but it wouldn't go past the knuckle. She asked me to try, but I couldn't get the ring on either. We left it there on the first knuckle. I was having trouble with my vision, tears coming down. She cried just a little, then regained her composure. Now, it's 1.05 p.m. We're back on the cabinet plane that's heading for Honolulu because it's turned around. And the voice from the White House Situation Room change from wayside, stand by, wayside, stand by, to wayside, Lancer is dead. So what you have there is you have the Secret Service code name for Pierre Salinger being wayside and the Secret Service name for President Kennedy being Lancer. Actually, Mrs. Kennedy was lace. Okay. 
Well, the man who officially announced the death of President Kennedy was Malcolm Kilduff. He was the assistant White House press secretary, and he was in Dallas because Pierre Salinger, the press secretary, was with the other cabinet members on that airplane. He had probably no idea in his life that he would be the man that would announce the death of the president. Well, Kilduff stated to Kenneth O'Donnell, Kenny, this is a terrible time to have to approach you on this, but the world has got to know President Kennedy is dead. And O'Connell, O'Donnell's response to Kilduff was, well, you are going to have to make the announcement, go ahead, but you better check with Mr. Johnson. He couldn't even call him President Johnson. Okay? As a result, Kilduff was the man who officially informed Vice President Johnson of the President's death. No one had told Lyndon Johnson that the President had died. And it was Malcolm Kilduff who told Johnson of the President's death. So remarkably, Lyndon Johnson was one of the last people in Parkland Hospital to find out that President Kennedy had died. Well, Malcolm Kilduff asked Lyndon Johnson for his approval to announce Kennedy's death to the public, and Johnson ordered that the announcement of the President's death be made only after he had left the hospital. This is what Johnson told Kilduff. I think I'd better get out of here before you announce it. We don't know whether this is a worldwide conspiracy, whether they are after me as well as they were after President Kennedy. So he didn't want anything announced until he got out of the Parkland Hospital area. Well, when Kilduff received confirmation that Johnson was back on Air Force One, he made preparations to announce President Kennedy's death to the press, and the press was all assembled in a nurse's classroom at Parkland Hospital. And so at 1.33 p.m., Malcolm Kildoff stated the following to the press. He said, quote, President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 p.m. Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound to the brain. I have no other details regarding the assassination.